Hello there. Today, I'll be talking about building dynamic forms in Rails. I'm Santi, a software engineer from Uruguay, a small country in South America, and I work at a global development company called Roostrap. I've been working with Rails applications for the past six years, and in the last time, I've been getting involved into open source. You can find me as SantiV on GitHub and as SantiV6 underscore on Twitter. Okay, let's start. The talk is called All You Need to Know to Build Dynamic Forms. So today I'll be using a real world example that our team had to build at work and I'll drive you through our implementation while sharing how we took the most out of the Rails ecosystem in order to implement this non-trivial feature. You might be wondering what is a dynamic form? I think of it as a form that can be configured in the database and without the need of a deployment, the changes are reflected in the app. In a few words, the feature is giving admins the ability to build these forms dynamically in a user interface and using them in different places of the app. We won't be focusing on the admin interface to create the forms. Instead, we're going to talk about how to render these dynamic forms, handle the submissions, validations, and more. Don't worry if it isn't completely clear what is the feature about yet, because I'll give you the proper context before diving into the solution. After that, we'll see how to render a dynamic form, add the validations, and save the data to complete the life cycle of a form. And finally, we'll see, we'll see how to deal with a more complex requirement that I call repeatable fields. The key takeaways, or what you can expect to have learned when this talk is over, are the design of the solution that we implemented, which leverages the Active Model API, on top of Active Model, we used a design pattern called Form Objects, and by the way, we started a very simple gem for Form Objects called YAF, which can be used to make things even simpler. And then, our takeaways are how to use different tools in the Rails ecosystem, such as Ruby Singleton class method and Hotwire tour streams, to enable Rails friendly solutions for more complex scenarios. Now I'll give you some context on the requirements so that we're all on the same page. At my current project, we provide a platform for universities so that I think they can have students take their courses online. I think it's amazing to make education accessible to more people and it became especially important during this pandemic. Given the nature of our app, universities will likely request customizing these forms to their needs. And that's how this feature was born. They wanted to have forms with multiple steps, like a wizard. In each step, they wanted to have multiple sections, and in each section, multiple fields. At the same time, fields could be of different types, like text, numeric, drop-down, radio buttons, and each field could define validations. And there were more requirements. Here you can see an example of how these features look like in our app. At the top, you have the steps. The current step is named personal information. And there is one section called about you, where there are some fields of different types, which could have some validations depending on how the admin set up this form. But don't panic. In this talk, we'll reduce the scope so that we can focus on what matters the most to us. We'll use the form that you're seeing here, which has a single step and only a text area and a select field. The purpose of this form is submitting a reference for an applicant. So in this example, the fields will be one to enter the strengths and weaknesses and the other a rating amongst his or her peers. On submit, it saves a new reference record to the database or in case that the validations didn't pass, it renders the errors. This is similar to what we get when running the Rails scaffold. However, universities needed to be customizable. For example, some universities might want to add more fields or change which fields are required. So what do we need to do to make this form be dynamic? Well, first of all, we'll need to store in the database the configuration of the form entered by the admins. To represent the dynamic forms in a relational database, we can use a model called form config which will rep represent the form as a whole. It has a title, just as a human-friendly identifier, and has many field configs. The field config model belongs to a form config, 
has a name such as email, a label that is displayed in the form, and a type of field like text area and select in this example. It also has options in case that it's a field type that allows it, like a select field, a position of course because nobody wants their forms to render the fields in a random order. In the scope of this talk, just one type of validation that is going to be the required validation, which is a boolean that can be turned on or off by the admin. And with this modeling in place, we can represent the form that we are going to use as example. And this is how the records, for our example, look like in the database. As you can see, for our example, the form configs table has one record, which title is references. And then there is the field configs table that has two records, and both of them are associated to the reference form config. Then we have their names, which are strength and weaknesses and rating, some long labels, the field types that are text area and select respect respectively, then the options that only applies to the rating and is between 0 and 10, the position in the form, and the boolean indicating that strength and weaknesses is a required field and that rating is an optional field. But now that we have the data structure, what do we need to do to bring dynamic forms to life? Well, in short, I would say that it can be divided into the following steps. To begin with, we need to render the fields defined by the form. This also implies rendering the correct type of field and in the correct order. Then we need to receive the form submission in some endpoint and validate the submitted attributes on the backend. On success, we save the data and redirect somewhere. Or in case that there were any errors, we render them and we should also keep the enter values. As always in programming, there are, there are infinite possible solutions to this. Some people, when thinking on dynamic stuff, will automatically think on the need of a JavaScript framework like React. But in our case, we wanted to find a solution that felt Rails friendly. In particular, because our, our team is formed by Rails developers and we find joy working with Rails, but not so much with JavaScript, to be honest. But what does a Rails friendly solution mean? Well, for us, it was that we could use mostly the same tools as with a normal form. To have a clear point of reference, we wanted to, that the code looks similar to the Rails scaffold, so that anyone joining the project could easily understand it and won't need to learn a different way of working with this code base. Ideally, we'd like to have a similar view as with a normal form that uses the form with builder and a similar controller doing if resource.save and either redirecting or rendering the errors. As a general rule, it's a good idea to avoid having business logic in controllers and views. So we would like to have all the business logic for dyna dynamic forms be encapsulated in models or just plain old Ruby objects. Okay, let's now see how to render a dynamic form. In this code, we can see how the normal form is rendered. I guess it looks familiar to you because it's mostly what we get when running a Rails scaffold. We render a label, we render the field, we render the errors, and at the bottom of the form, there is a submit button. So how can we render the dynamic form in a similar way? Like this. As you can see at the first glance, the structure of the code is pretty similar. But instead of rendering the hard-coded attributes, now there is a loop because we need to iterate through the field config records in the database and render each of them. On the form builder, we use public send with a field type, so that Rails renders the correct type of field. This means that in the field type stored in the database needs to be a known tag builder by Rails. Could be text field, text area, select, or other, because if it's not a known tag builder, this code will raise an exception. And now look at the arguments of the form with method. We use an object called form that replaces the reference, references model in the normal form. This object called form is the model of our form builder and will be used by Rails to pre-fill the form values. 
For this reason, it needs to define the dynamic attributes. It also needs to respond to the errors method because we are using it to render the errors below each field. Also notice that we need to pass to it to this partial the URL where we want to submit the data. Because the idea of this partial is to be reusable across the app. By receiving the URL as an argument, it can submit the, the form to different endpoints depending on, on where and for which purpose it is being rendered. So now we have the question, what is that object that I call form? Is it the form config model that we created before? No, it wouldn't really make sense to use an active record model because we need the attributes to be defined dynamically, depending on the configuration of the form. But Rails allows us to use the form with builder with a plain old Ruby object. And here's the deal. Fortunately, active model provides us some modules that we can use to enhance our objects and make them play well together with other parts of Rails. So let's ch check them out. Probably you already know about Active Model because we use it all the time together with our Active Record models. But did you know that Active Model is also intended to be used without Active Record? Active Model is a set of modules that can be added to Ruby classes to augment their behavior. By making your object compliant with the defined Active Model API, you'll be able to use other features in Rails like, like root generation out of the box. Let's take a look at the ActiveMall API so to understand what it gives us and how we can use it for our needs. ActiveModel has many modules, but there is a default one that implements the basic API required to integrate with ActionPack, and it's called ActiveModel colon colon model. If we include this module in our plain old Ruby object, we'll be getting model name introspection, conversions, translations, which we aren't going to make use of any of this specifically in our example. And then we also get what we were needing. Validations, initialization, such as with any Rails model, and the ability to be used with the form with builder. So this is great, and certainly it is Rails friendly. So seems like a good idea to use it. Before going on, I would like to mention some other modules provided by ActiveModel which can be of use in your day-to-day -day job. And they are Attribute methods, which let you define methods for all of the attributes of your object Callbacks, that provide facilities to add callbacks for certain operations Dirty, to track value changes For example, it gives you the attribute was and attribute change methods Errors, which is used in the ActiveModel validations module but can also be used standalone. It provides a, an interface to your object so errors are handled in the same way as active record models. And serialization that helps serializing your objects. This module is for example used by the Rails JSON serializer, which is in turn used by our active record models, and that's why we can call to JSON on the models and get their JSON representation for free. As you can see, active model is very powerful and you can, take, you can take advantage of it. More specifically, you can use it to prevent bloating your active record models by extracting pieces of logic into separate objects which don't need to be connected to the database. After this talk, I encourage you to go and check them because they'll probably be of help in your day-to-day -day job. And this is how we can use Active Model. Notice that it's a plain Ruby class called dynamic form that includes the active model model default module so that it can have validations, the ERC interface, that it can be initialized with attributes, and we can use it in the view with the form width builder. See here that in the initialize method, we are first setting the accessors for the dynamic attributes and then calling super with the attributes so that active model can actually set them to the object. Setting the accessors before calling super is really important. Otherwise, it would, would raise an exception because the writers for the dynamic attributes wouldn't exist. To be able to set the accessors for dynamic attributes, we iterate through them, and for each of them, we call singleton class.attributeaccessor with the field name. 
Wait, what was that? Have you ever heard of Singleton class? What kind of dark magic is that? Well, turns out that Singleton class is a very cool method that all ruby objects have. It's extremely powerful and despite we don't usually make explicit use of it on our projects, it's commonly used in gems, including rails. When you call it an object, you get access to a meta class of the instance. That meta class belongs only to this instance, so you can change or extend its behavior by manipulating its singleton class. This meta class is hidden in the inheritance chain, so it doesn't show up as an ancestor of the object, but we can think of it as the first ancestor when it comes to dispatching methods. So anything that we declare there will take precedence even over the actual class of the instance. Cool, huh? So going back, this is all we need to do to set the existing values. We are adding the attribute accessor for each field to the meta class of the instance, and then when calling super, active model will take care of setting the values. But what if we want to add validations? Active model gives us the validates method that we can add to the class, but we can't use it like this, because the different, different instances of the class will define different attributes and also different validations on them. So again, we can make use of singleton class to add our dynamic validations. Notice how we are also using the same active model validates method as before, which works at the class level, but this time we are calling it on the singleton class of the instance. With this, each dynamic form object will define the correct validations. And in our example, uh, that the, we only had the required validation, we check if the field is configured to be required, and only in that case we add the presence validation to the singleton class. Now that we have the view and the active model object working together, we need to solve how to handle the form submission. Here's the controller for the normal form of the example. It's pretty much the same as a scaffold generated controller. And this is how it looks like the same controller but using the dynamic form instead of the reference model directly. You can see here that it's mostly the same. In the new action, instead of initializing the reference, we initialize a dynamic form object. And in the create action, we initialize the form as well but this time we also passed the reference model to it so that when we call save on the dynamic form we'll be saving the new reference to the database. But wait, we can't just call save on the dynamic form object. Active model doesn't provide it because it actually doesn't know anything about persistence. So we'll need to implement it ourselves and when doing that we're implementing what is a known design pattern in the Rails community called form objects. The name says it all. They are objects which purpose is to handle all the logic of a form in your app. That includes handling validation, saving multiple models, performing actions like sending emails and more. You can use this pattern not only with dynamic forms, but also with normal forms. As I said at the beginning of the talk, we extracted a gem to implement the form object pattern named YAF, as the acronym of yet another active form. We name it this way because there have been many attempts to create an official gem for form objects in the past. What's more, even the name action form is registered in, the, in Ruby gems by the Rails core team because some time ago they considered adding this pattern as part of the framework. I won't be using JAF in our example because I want it to be explicit on what it's needed to make dynamic form works. But I encourage you to go and take a look at its source code. It's just 60 lines of code and can help you get started with form objects. Going back, notice how in the create action, we decided to pass the reference model to the form object instead of building it in the dynamic form class. That's because we don't want the dynamic form class to know about any specific business logic so that it can be reused across the app. Uh, if you have 
more complex requirements like sending an email when the reference is submitted or if you won't know in advance the fields that can be submitted, there could be some other more suitable implementations like composing form objects or storing the data in a JSON attribute respectively. But let's leave that for another day. As I said before, we need to implement the save method and we want it to behave similarly to the active record save method. So the first thing it needs to do is run the validations and return false if they don't pass. There is also an option to skip validations such as with active record models. And if all the validations pass or were skipped, then we need to persist in the database the model with the submitted attributes. There is also the bank version of the method uh, such as active record models have, which calls save but instead of returning true or false, it raises an exception if the object is invalid. This is especially important when saving models within a transaction. And here you can see the dynamic form in action. It handles the validations in the backend, marking the fields with errors, keeping the values across renders, and in case of success, creating a new reference in the database. Remember that this solution not only works for the references form, I can use it wherever I want, I just need to render the dynamic form partial with a dynamic form object and a URL where to the form will be submitted. And then we need to tweak the controller that will be receiving that form submission. I tried to make the implementation as simple as possible for the talk, but remember it can be extended to support more complex features. But there's more. Now our product managers want to have some fields be repeatable. In our team, this feature was also known as the final boss. What I mean when I say repeatable fields is showing an add another button and don't click generating a new repetition of the field in the form. In our project, there were some additional requirements like having a minimum amount of repetitions be required or to have multiple fields repeat together, but again, we reduce the scope so to focus on what matters the most to us. Check in the example form that we added a new field called other comments, which is configured to be repeatable and that's why it has an add button below and a cross next to it. Right from the beginning, we knew that adding this feature wasn't going to be trivial. There is even a section in the Rails guides that says that if you want to add fields on the fly, uh, when a user clicks on an add new address button, well that Rails doesn't provide any built-in support for this. There are gems that helps us with this like Cocoon, but in this case we thought it was not worth it to add an R dependency which probably implements lots of our features we don't really need. So what are our options? We could build the fields up front and show, the, show or hide them with JavaScript, or we could insert and remove DOM nodes with JavaScript. And well, we, de we decided to go with building the fields up front so that the rendering still lived only on, in the backend. The cons were that there was a limit on the amount of repetitions that um, when the remove button was clicked, we needed to not only hide the field, but also clean up the field and then that there is still a need for JavaScript, even if it's mostly just a hide and Joe logic. At the same time, some teammates were investigating some long-term alternatives, not only for this feature, but because we started to see the need to add more complex features in the front-end that weren't straightforward in vanilla Rails. They did a proof of concept with React and Redux, which went pretty well. But before there was a resolution on it, Hotwire got released, and immediately they started building the same proof of concept to see how it compared one to each other. The results were impressive. The Hotwire proof of concept was implemented with significantly less code and also in much less time. Furthermore, I guess it's not a surprise if I say that without doubt, the Hotwire solution was more Rails friendly. So that was enough to discard React and make Hotwire part of our stack, which, by the way, will be part of the default Rails stack since Rails 7. Does that mean that 
now we can remove our custom JavaScript solution for repeatable fields and instead use Hotwire? Let's see. Hotwire is composed by three frameworks. They are Turbo, Stimulus, and Strata. Turbo is a set of techniques to make our apps feel like single-page applications. Stimulus is a JavaScript framework, and Strata is for mobile apps. Given that we are looking for a JavaScript-free solution, let's take a closer look at Turbo. Turbo is divided into, the, into four components. Turbo Drive, Turbo Frames, Turbo Streams, and Turbo Native. Turbo Drive makes navigation more fluent. Turbo Frames helps decompo decomposing complex pages. And Turbo Native is for native mobile apps. And then there is Turbo Streams that lets us send partial page updates from our server to the browser. We can respond to Ajax requests with, uh, with HTML to be inserted in our DOM. And actually, there are five modes for the DOM manipulation. They are append, prepend, replace, update, and remove. So the answer is yes. We can repla replace the custom JavaScript solution for a solution that uses Turbo Streams. What we're going to do is the following. When the add button is clicked, Turbo will intercept the event and perform an Ajax request to the server. The server will render the new field and when the response gets back to the browser, Turbo will append it after the last field. Along the same lines, each field will have the a delete button next to it, so that it, when it's clicked, Turbo will make an Ajax request to the server that responds with another Turbo stream, but this time with a remove mode, indicating to Turbo that it has to remove, to remove that particular element from the DOM. This is how the view looks now with the code to support repeatable fields. Everything is exactly the same, except that if the field is repeatable, we'll render a new partial where all the new logic lives. In the new partial, there is a div with a unique ID wrapping all the repetitions of this field. Inside that wrapper, we need to render the field n times with existing values. And the wrapper will also be used by Turbo to know where to append the, the fields that are added on the fly. And then we have the add button. You can see it's a plain link to, to a new controller action specific for dynamic forms. Just by telling it which is the field config that needs to be rendered, the server will know how to do it. There are a few gotchas though. First one is that the link is wrapped in a turbo frame so that it doesn't change the URL of the browser. And the other one is that it has a data attribute so that a stimulus controller sets a header to the request. This isn't ideal, but it's needed so that we can respond to a get request with a turbo stream. Don't forget that turbo is still in beta phase, so take this as a workaround for now until turbo provides a better solution. Going into the details of the repeatable field partial, see here that it's similar to the non-repeatable version. The difference being that we are making use of a, an option multiple true so that Rails builds the HTML field in a way that then the value is going to be submitted as part of an array of values for this field. And then we have the remove button that is another link too, but this time with a delete, delete method. Because it uses the delete HTTP method instead of a get method, we don't need any of the workarounds we saw before. So much cleaner, isn't it? Now uh, that we have seen how to add and remove buttons a render, let's see how they work in the backend. This is the controller action that receives the request when the add button is clicked. It only initializes the objects that then are going to be used in the view. And here's the view, which file extension is .turbostream.erb. Rails will know it needs to render this view because of the format of the request. Here uh, we render a Turbo Stream tag with the append action. That's a meta tag that is used internally by Turbo. And inside it, we have the actual HTML for our field. We use fields4 to get the Rails form builder, and we use it to render the field by reusing the same partial we previously saw. Notice here that we are using a secure random UUID 
to identify this repetition. That's because there isn't anything else that identifies it. Uh, since it's not in the data database and we don't even have the count of how many repetitions have been rendered in the front end. So this identifier will then be used to know which repetition to remove when the delete button gets clicked. And similarly, we have an action and a view for removing a field. The only difference is that it now responds to a TurboStream meta tag with a remove action specifying the ID of the DOM element to be removed. Neat, huh? We just refactored a solution that requires uh, custom, custom JavaScript and now all the logic lives in the backend, thanks to Hotwire. It's not that we don't need JavaScript anymore because Turbo is still a JavaScript framework. So behind the scenes, J uh, JavaScript still plays an important role in the solution, but it's all hidden from you and we can enjoy just having to code in Ruby. I'm very happy that CodeWire got released and now we have so much more power while still continuing to develop code in the server side and more specifically in Rails. Here is the result. You can see how the repeatable field called other comments has an add button below to it and the cross next to it each repetition. Uh, when the cross is clicked, a request appears in the network tab which gets back with a turbo stream with a remove mode, and then the field is removed from the DOM. The same happens with the add button, only that it has the append mode and the field gets appended in the DOM. So this was it. We covered a lot of things and I hope you can find them useful for your day-to-day -day job and be able to take the most out of Rails that without doubt is an extremely powerful framework. In summary, we saw how to implement a Rails-friendly solution for a non-trivial feature. The solution has no custom JavaScript, so Ruby developers can still work on their preferred pro programming language. This solution can be extended to support even more complex scenarios. The solution is reusable across the app, and we dive into the Active Model API, Object Singleton Class method, and Hotwire and use them all together to implement a real-world use case. So I hope you can now consider these to be new tools in your toolbox. Thanks for attending my talk, hope you have enjoyed it, and continue to enjoy the rest of the conference. Fin finally, I'll leave here some sources that you might find helpful, including the sample app with a full implementation.